And China's already there with almost a billion people on that mechanism and now with their own global digital currency. So there is a race with the US, there is a race with the UK to get their own digital coin. And then all of a sudden there'll be a breeding exercise. Uh, they'll stop their negative narrative on our ecosystem. Within Bitcoin, it's a very, very niche area. And when you go to events like Bitcoin 2021 or Miami, you kind of see all of these worlds collide. I mean, what is your sense of like how things have changed over time or like what where the industry is at today? It was over five years ago, um, six years ago, I launched an ETF, ETF called Jets. And uh, it's had an incredible run in the past year. Uh, and, and it's interesting because I was trying to launch a Bitcoin ETF and realized quickly after launching Jets that uh, Bitcoin wasn't going to go through at the time due to concerns by the SEC on anti-money laundering laws and KYC. So a hacker's Bitcoin showing up in a listed ETF in New York Stock Exchange was just not going to happen when they're under their watch. I went to Canada, same thing. And I had this information, this knowledge about the industry and friends called me and they didn't believe, they still didn't believe they were gold bucks and they didn't believe in this. And I had written a book on gold and I was a well-known recognized speaker and gold fund manager uh, around the world uh, and speaking at the institutional shows and retail. And, and so I saw this transition going on with really smart gold investors that had, what's happened with Bitcoin, what should it be, why the positioning and, what I recognized in my research was that when you mine that Bitcoin or Ethereum, you validate a transaction and you get rewarded with a virgin coin. It's untouched. And, and so that meant there would be no AML concern or risk. And if you hold it, like they're trying to do for an ETF or a closed end fund, well, you only had uh, clean coins. And that was the original strategy of saying, okay, I'll get behind this idea I'll be the chair and I'll write the first big institutional check. And I put $5 million into the creation of the first crypto mining company. And it was an incredible ride. I, I never made so much money on paper in a week and lost a year later uh, in crypto <laughs> winter. Uh, I never sold any. And it was just an amazing experience of watching the industry. Now, one of the things that also triggered me into the creation a backing up hive, this concept was that I went to the consensus conference in New York and the keynote speaker is the CEO of a multi-trillion dollar fund group and the largest discount broker, uh, Fidelity. And Abigail Johnson is a CFA and doesn't speak at investment conferences, but she's speaking at a crypto event. Now, why and what's her story and, and how they look at this sort of three entry system of accounting, which is a breakthrough from the Phoenicians and the Medicis in the 1400 of double entry accounting. Now we're going to get triple entry accounting and how this is a, a major significant boom and had all the credit default swaps or is what Warren Buffett called them weapons of mass destruction. They had been on a blockchain, the Federal Reserve would have seen that the liability was only seven billion, write a check, and you wouldn't have had the global crisis that took place because no one knew how big these weapons of mass destruction were. And, and she's commenting. And so I said, something big is happening. And a lot of those investment conferences, your invitation only paid by institutional banks and brokers, or they are the retail and it's free. So a big retail, like the money show in Orlando gets 7,000, 6,000 people. But the Miami show just recently showed you what was going on and validate what was happening pre-COVID. 12,000 people showed up. And it was a 15-minute Uber drive. It wasn't across the street. This And it was hot and it was humid. Didn't matter. Uh, and they paid $600 a ticket. And at the gate, it was 1,200. So this only validates this momentum of the ecosystems and in this journey of getting behind the creation of Hive was recognizing these nodes, these validators around the world. And at one time, there was 10,000 Bitcoin node validators around the world. Well, you can't get that for tech stocks. You can't get that for gold stocks. You, But you have it in this new ecosystem. And then it blew me away with Ethereum having 30,000. 
So there is something happening that is still not grasped, except for, I believe, the smartest the elite, even with the Federal Reserve and what they're doing today. In my opinion, that Janet Yellen is really an elitist, hasn't come out of the closet yet, socialist. She was a big a head of the Federal Reserve, the most powerful bank in the world. You know, she was all part of that ushering in uh, global taxation and regulation and the EU pushing it for harmonization. Well, harmonization just means more taxes and regulations. And now being the most powerful office for Secretary Treasury, she, all of a sudden she ushers in this support for G7 minimum corporate tax. And immediately you see the London bankers that they're pushing out. They don't want to be part of that because you need to have tax free zones to create competition. We know this in America, uh, San Antonio, where I'm based in Texas, a Toyota plant is here manufacturing their truck. There's many cities across America competing, but we gave the best tax concessions. Deng Xiaoping said, get get rich is glorious. It doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, it's who catches the mouse, it's pragmatism. Well, to create and ignite the growth in China, he created seven tax-free zones along the coast. And tax-free zones attract capital and create jobs and innovation. The big talk of the town right now is everything that's been happening in China and the migration of miners out of China. What are your thoughts on that particular move that, that the party decided to make? China wants to compete with the U.S. dollar. They want the one to compete. And this happened, uh, started over 10 years ago. And what you saw in 2001, 2002 was the G7, the G20 was synchronized global trade and lowering of tariffs and, and get China into the WTO. It was a big global boom that took place. And after the 08 crisis, it ushered in sort of global tax and regulation. And that was, you, you can see, that was a, a phenomenon that, that hasn't totally gone away. Only for four years under Trump did that get stopped and some of it pushed back. But now it's full throttle again. So you have to look at these macro forces. So what we've been seeing in gold in 2008 was 700. Then it runs to you know, 2,000. And so I believe it's going to go to 4,000. And I believe Bitcoin's going to go to 100,000 uh, in this next wave and this cycle. And there's different reasons for that. But I think what's important is that China wants to compete with the U.S. dollar. And they're big buyers of oil from Saudi Arabia and natural gas from Qatar. And they want U.S. dollars. So they've said, if you want that, you have to back it by gold. So what have you seen since this 2008? China's the largest gold producer in the world, and China is the biggest net buyer of gold. And they're using gold to prop up the value of their currency. And they really want to push that currency. Now they're going with a digital money. And the same thing, they've got to have some of gold. America has Fort Knox as a gold underpinning behind the currency, even though it's no longer convertible into gold, but it is still the support of it. China is wants to compete at that level. They don't want competition. They don't want a Bitcoin to compete with them. Uh, and, and they really don't want anything to compete with them. So what we've witnessed is in the growth of China over the past 21 years, in particular, or 30 years, I would say, is probably a, a bigger number, this exponential growth, is they skipped telephone poles. They just went to cellular. So the Chinese of building out infrastructure, building out systems, have skipped a lot of things. And one of the big parts is really they jumped right into digital money. And the digital money has come from WeChat. And WeChat does everything today. And WeChat is basically their way to control everything in their system. And one of my analysts a couple of years ago was in China trying to buy toothpaste. He couldn't do it with a credit card or cash. It had to be on his phone. So there's a tracking system for digital money. And now they want to have a global digital currency. Their credibility is going to be gold. So we're seeing gold go over into Switzerland, get melted down from bigger bars into smaller wafers, get sent over to China. And you're seeing now, which I think is very significant, Bitcoin mining being shifted to North America. So we have this sort of sea change taking place. Good luck to all those miners going into Kazakhstan. You know, Kazakhstan pollutes the world predominantly with coal and, and it's just fraught with corruption. We know this from the gold business. Guys would come to us with this gold asset in, in Kazakhstan or an oil asset. And they would say, look it, 
gold assets are worth $100 an ounce of gold in the ground, and I can buy it in Kazakhstan for 10. This is a cheap public company, and there's a reason for it. If that company ever goes into production, the Kazakh mafia will just take the money. You'll never get that money out. You'll never benefit as a public shareholder. I have 40 years of experience with this. <laughs> and, and so I saw the same thing with oil assets. You can buy oil assets for five cents of the dollar. As soon as that production had to go, pipeline shifts, et cetera, confiscation of the asset, it, it's just really deplorable. So good luck for the Chinese going there. I think they'll all get ripped off. And uh, it's probably the best thing for crypto mining for North America and the Nordic countries. Uh, the pools, now we're shifting at Hive to Foundry's pool because we believe there's going to be greater transparency. There is going to be rule of law, very important as a fund manager and have experience in funding gold operations in, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Rule of law is very significant, and the best countries are where there's common law. So America's common law. So now all of a sudden we're going to get something that they instantly, the parties are accountable, responsible, and if they're not competitive, you can switch. So I'm really thrilled about this, this growth that's taking place in North America and Nordic countries. Especially from a mining point of view, it, it was interesting. I didn't know that full background on how the similar type of uh, opportunity was available to go. And for example, in gold, you could get gold at a much lower price, but uh, you're taking on a lot of risk there. And I feel like miners right now are facing a similar type of decision in a different way. Let's say you had all your miners out running in China, you were taking on clearly a huge risk at that time. And it blew up in, in your face with this recent black swan event and having to ship your miners out of the country. It also really important, Will, is it helps in being decentralized. China was becoming too big. You know, the, one of the concerns was the Communist Party shows up or the five families that control most of the mining in China and say, oh, your family and all your kids and your mothers and aunts are all under house arrest. And unless you all of a sudden all work together to destroy Bitcoin, we're gonna put you away forever. I mean, that, that's some of the stuff. Jack Ma gave a speech that was sort of criticizing the communist bureaucrats, and uh, it was called the $5 billion air ball. It was a bomb. And he immediately got ushered away to house arrest and yeah. it didn't go public. It's a $5 billion mistake on a speech. You bring up a great point. A lot of the miners that I've been speaking with are saying that this is actually one of the best things that could have happened for the network, just in terms of protecting it long term. For the, in the short term, it's very, very difficult for all the miners who had to get shut down. But in terms of the distribution of hash power, I mean, it is pretty remarkable at how this is going to change things moving forward. And we might be looking back in 20 years and looking at what China did, looking at it as one of the biggest geopolitical blunders in history, uh, which is pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> it wouldn't be a blunder for them for their political ambitions but it would be a big benefit for the freer world. Yeah. I think that's why I look at it, is it's for freedom. And the Bitcoin you see is so well used. A classic example is where are the most, most of the ATM machines in America? They're in Miami and in Orlando and then New York. Well, why are they there? Well, how do Venezuelans get their money out? How do Argentines get their money out? How do Brazilians? It's the only way without atrocious, corrupt governments confiscating your assets. The more socialistic a country is, the less respect they have for private property rights. And that's really important if you're, I'm not a lawyer, but dealing in the regulated world uh, and having so many lawyers pay and work with, the US with patents and patent land and having your private property, it allowed for the breakthrough of fracking for oil and gas. It would never have happened in Mexico because you don't own, if you find oil in your land, it's the government's. Same thing with most of Africa. But if it's under common law, it's yours. Friends of mine have a massive ranch here in South Texas. They're 3% of all natural gas. Big environmentalist because he has 20,000 acres and he wants to make sure the ground is safe and clean, has all these exotic animals from Africa on it, et cetera. But he has the best systems for drilling and for cleaning and keeping the environment, the whole ecosystem robust. So this really happens under common law. 
patent protection. It's your song, you're protected. It's your book, you're protected. Under civil law countries, it's very debatable. You really don't have that rule of law. Now the shifting for me, I am so delighted. Yeah. What do you think are the best areas to mine from that perspective in terms of having the ability to go and trust in the rule of law in the place where you're going in your mining? Clearly, the U.S. is is a wonderful place. Canada, and you can see that Quebec Hydro has its own sort of lobbying group is the aluminum companies. So they basically control a lot of the narrative with the government and they're anti-Bitcoin mining because they're worried that money will go there for energy and they create all this negative scenario. So one has to look at the tip of an iceberg and say, what you actually see is not what's going underneath. Oh, you're only seeing one eighth of it, seven eighths. Uh, make sure your ship isn't a Titanic and it hit that iceberg. You got to look underneath and find out really what's driving it. It's aluminum industry that's been driving the negative narrative in Quebec. And on the internet at Miami conference, it was a lot was Ripple. R- Ripple's not a not a crypto coin, really, but they're under attack by the regulator for what they've done. But they have uh, these bots out there that attack crypto mining. They attacked anyone that's Bitcoin because they try to position in the minds of people that Ripple is a better place to be and Bitcoin Ethereum is bad. There's all these narratives going around in the space. One piece that I think it's really important for all miners to touch on right now is the whole ESG conversation. And every miner that I'm speaking with falls at some different point on that spectrum. What are your thoughts on all this? I mean, it, it seems to be such a huge conversation right now. And it's different if you're talking with a miner who's actually going and producing Bitcoin versus someone who's done some let's say, average in-depth type of research versus the person who's not even in the industry and they're looking in and then they're just picking a handful of stats and comparing the energy usage to different countries. I mean, what what are your thoughts on just the environment today of this conversation and, and the true fundamentals behind it? One, I've been very disappointed for the Hive shareholders because fortunately I'm a fund manager and I saw ESG growing, especially in the mining industry. And I've had to deal with green fanatics for a long time. You're it's probably the best person to answer this question, to be honest. It's a religion. And you can see in places in England, join the Green Party and they'll give you the Ten Commandments of joining their religion. And so it was easy for the ripples of the world or other people to use them is to go after like they've done after gold mining. And and ESG has grown and mining companies have been, particularly the Canadian mining and Australian mining companies have been real stewards of leadership in Latin America and Africa for hospitals, for schools. uh, I know in Mexico, the government got worried because the Canadians were much more effective and efficient in in helping uh, the poor villages and also a clean environment. So the biggest disaster in Brazil was government mining company, not a public mining company. It is public, but not one that uh, has an independent board. But let's talk about the ESG. So Hive has an ESG strategy. We're green and clean. That's all I want to do is mine green and clean coins because I believe four years ago, this would become more significant. But what happened was everyone that is a miner got pulled down to that narrative. You have to be so careful of what goes on with the. We know in the mining business, Oxfam, they call it Ox Scam. You know what they did in Haiti, in Central America. They'll pay off, create misinformation, disinformation because they're zealots. But you know, there are a lot of gold bugs I've noticed over time. They're also zealots too. You know, they, they actually don't buy much gold, they don't buy many gold stocks. They just want to be an anti government statement. And so one has to put on sunblock to go into this space. You want to go and enjoy and be a participant, but make sure you got lots of sunblock on. It's been good because guys like Michael Saylor have shown tremendous leadership. I've been involved with that committee. I know some of the other CEOs, one of them said only three months ago, didn't care that they were using coal to mine. All of a sudden he's changed. He's got religion right away. And not green. It's basically, you can't say those type of things. You have to be sensitive over the environment. And so I do think that it basically made everyone focus. Michael Saylor took a great lead with that, got with Elon Musk. We had a call very early on a Sunday afternoon with Elon Musk, a Zoom call. We all participated. And and even Elon Musk said, you know, you, you have to correct your narrative. And there's consultants out there. If you're not you know, using coal and, and you're, you're not using uh, heavy oil like they're doing in Venezuela, then you should 
make sure you tell your story better. So the industry really start pulling their own information and everyone sent it in and it's decentralized. It's not like the World Gold Council where you have to give a dollar for every ounce of gold you produce into the World Gold Council and it has a big bureaucracy, even though I know it's a great, great organization, the World Gold Council. But this council is more decentralized. So if we need money, everyone is expected to throw in money to maintain the educational dialogue and format every quarter to basically put in the data. And what we really showed was we consume so much less electricity that was alleged. We dismissed that this the green movement and it came to all of a sudden hurt everyone in the industry. The CEOs running these other crypto mining companies are so much more sophisticated because Hive was the first. And when Hive came in, all of a sudden there's all these copycats and there were more stock promoters. The Riot was a classic. SEC went after all of them. We had issues with other people just trying to copy the success of Hive. Novacrats' company went public in Canada before the US because of the capital formation structure lend itself easier for blockchain uh, new adventures. And so I see that the CEOs back then were more like pumps and dumpsters. And like a lot of the original ICOs, they really didn't have corporate governance. Today is different. I tell you, Will, the crypto mining public companies, it's another level. It's institutional. They're articulate. They grasp the concepts, the issues, and it's going to march forward. So I remain very, very bullish on this as a growth industry. I think that what the council's been doing, and you guys definitely play a, a large role in this, it's been incredible. I remember being on that that Twitter discussion that where Michael Saylor and all the others came and start talking, sharing about what the goals of the council were and how people could participate. And I really like the ethos of decentralization. And the questions that were being asked were really, hey, what is what's going on here? We don't want the bureaucracy that many could see an organization like this becoming. And the ethos behind it really seemed to be, hey, everyone can participate. We want education out there. And we want to just make sure that we can protect the industry and show the facts, not have a narrative dictated to us by people who aren't in the industry. Let's get the real hard data and show how green this industry really is. And I think it's incredible what you guys are doing. Thank you. And one of the parts of our earlier vision in building out Hive, besides being green and hydro at the time and geothermal, was solar. And we still have not found a deal that was attractively missed on one because we were busy grasping with other issues. But uh, there's tax credits, you know, in the U.S. So if you build a solar farm, so we'll explore things like that. You know, maybe we have to go and build you know, our own, buy enough land that we have our own solar facility and wind. So when you drive, by the way, took the family for a week and we drove all the way to the Grand Canyon, Santa Fe, then over the Grand Canyon and down to L.A. and back. It was an incredible trip to see all the trucks and trains on the roads and what was going on and the economy coming back to life. And what you see when you go across Texas is wind farms. And I'm talking about massive, massive wind farms and a lot of it funded by Exxon. That electricity is funding their pipelines. A lot of people don't realize there are surplus electricity. And then you see some where there's been flaring of excess natural gas. And I think what you're seeing now, big push where there's facilities of excess natural gas build a center near there and do the crypto mining. So it's basically stranded electricity or stranded uh, natural gas that's not going to get on the grid. All of a sudden, it can be involved in a cleaner mechanism. And natural gas is much, much, much cleaner than coal, a multiple exponential difference. So I think we are seeing this run for alternative sources of energy. Right now, friends of mine in Texas, uh, they're looking you know, build out 1.2 gigabytes. And I saw this, by the way, in Eastern Europe, where you find stranded electricity. So what we were finding in, in New York State, et cetera, old facilities that were for aluminum or et cetera, are basically repurposed them. So you have hydroelectricity doing nothing, and then you can repurpose it, and you can do, go into into digital this digital world we're going into. Uh, we're seeing that in Sweden. One of the big parts we did with Hive, the ESG strategy, was to work with the community and helping kids go to hockey games, and also funding for colleges for gaming, the gaming industry. And the bigger part was the software. So. 
when you have this big surge of demand for electricity, in particular in the morning when everyone turns on their toasters and hair dryers, and then at dinner, we could take the software, our 20 megawatts to one megawatt in 15 seconds. And then yeah. we could take it right back up. So rather than spending hundreds of billions of dollars for these uh, energy demand surges or big costs put on the local community, we are partners with them. The hydro company pays us to do that. So we actually don't lose out for the digital mining business. We help the community. We use software. If it was a hydro facility, it would take 15 minutes to tool up. We do it in 15 seconds. This is part of that whole ESG strategy. So with that, we get invited to other communities. There's a steel plant and manufacture stealing, and uh, they want to repurpose their company. They have all this surplus electricity. It's going nowhere. Can we use their building? Can you reconfigure it? What we do? We're getting invitations, and we know that Chinese have been knocking on the door to one of They don't want them because in 2018, they just bolted away and they left big electrical bills. They just didn't care. And they don't care about the community. They just care about how cheap they get electricity and grind every penny they can get out of it. They don't think with this ESG mindset. So I do say, say with the public and shareholders, it's helped us. It's helped us get an invitation to participate with them. I think that that's great. Uh, a lot of people don't really get that inside look into what's actually happening day to day. How are you impacting the communities where you go and build facilities? You're hiring local people. You're helping communities, contributing to the local organizations you contribute to when you go to that community and just create a tremendous amount of economic development. If you weren't there helping out that local community where you decide to go and build your facility, then that Bitcoin would be produced elsewhere in the world. So it really does help wherever a mining facility goes. Something else I would share with your listeners, because uh, right now crypto's gone under ever since uh, the new president's come in and uh, Janet Yellen's taken over secretary treasury responsibilities. You can see that. And, and the negative narrative against crypto uh, is accelerated. You can really see this in 2018. Now, I've heard of this manipulation of gold prices and a bunch of bankers got charged and, and they do spoof the market, it's called, where they say they're selling a gazillion contracts and they really aren't. They're just trying to hit stop losses and they play with this market information. But when we come to the crypto space and what happened in 2018, one of the biggest trash talkers was JP Morgan. And interesting, they were really doing this and same with Facebook all through 18 because they were running to create their own coin. So I try to share with your listeners, you have to look underneath the water. You have to see the seven eighths of the iceberg. Just don't look at the top of what's happening underneath. And I think that what took place, and you could see every time Congress is going to have a meeting to talk about Bitcoin, you would see the Senate is going to talk about Bitcoin. The SEC is going to talk about Bitcoin. It would sell off right to the date of that meeting and then all of a sudden have a pop. The bottom in crypto took place in February 2019 when JP Morgan announced their stablecoin. And Bitcoin rallies up to $5,000. And all of a sudden, Facebook comes out with their Libra coin and it surges to over $10,000. And you people are not going to advertise on Facebook again because they finally got out. And then all the G20 finance ministers did a pile a pile on, which is illegal in hockey and football, but they did a pile on, on on Libra because it's competition because they haven't got their own digital coin out yet. This is really about slowing down the, the, the success of Bitcoin Ethereum while governments try to get control of the narrative and get their own coin out in the marketplace. The Economist just came up with a feature story showing GovCoin. It's a picture uh, and it tells a story of what is going on. So I, I think it's recognizing that we're living 2018 all over again, but I think it's much more compressed of what's going on because as this is happening, positive news yesterday for the ecosystem with Visa, the exponential growth they're experiencing, PayPal was very, very significant last year of allowing young people or anyone with a PayPal account to buy a fraction. You didn't have to buy $50,000 coin, you can buy $500, a fractal. And two, it, you can't buy any of my ETFs, Jets and GoAU. You can't buy those on PayPal, but you can buy Bitcoin. 
And you could turn around and sell that because you bought it at $10,000 and it went to $60,000 and you could have sold half of it, bought a new TV at Best Buy or Amazon. That mechanism, you couldn't do that in your brokerage account. You had to go from your brokerage account to your bank and back to the fourth and you had all this process. It was seamless under PayPal. This is how the world's going to go. PayPal will end up becoming you know, a form of a Robin Hood down the road and then showing you the digital lack of friction of going back and forth and the IRS will be able to track it. You'll have to pay taxes on it, et cetera. But the fact that it was seamless, that's what's yeah. really important. And we know from Metcalf's law that Bitcoin's capped at 21 million coins. And as more users come online, the exponential growth will take place. So I, I think it's all very, very positive and bullish. Uh, right now, China, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a China's is ahead of the U.S. I think today it's announced with Reuters that the EU have a digital coin. It's today. It's hot off the press, baby. <laughs> hot off the press. It, it fits into my narrative. What I'm trying to share with people is look at the negative narrative and then look underneath it. The Bank of International Settlements doesn't like gold. They want to control any gold lending or selling. They hate crypto because they don't control it. How could the Bank of International Settlements love Venezuela, talk trash over Bitcoin, which is about freedom and not corrupt drug lords like Maduro and Chavez before him? Because they want to have their own control mechanism. And Gemini talks about that they're going to learn to work with regulations. They're going to deal with it just like Coinbase has. So there is regulations going to come into the industry. The government does want everything to go digital. And remember the story of my fund manager. He's in China a couple of years ago. He couldn't get toothpaste with cash or a credit card. And if he didn't have a PayPal type of WeChat account, he couldn't get his toothpaste. And China's already there with almost a billion people on that mechanism and now with their own global digital currency. So there is a race with the US, there is a race with the UK to get their own digital coin. And then all of a sudden there'll be a breathing exercise. Uh, they'll stop their negative narrative on our ecosystem. Hearing you speak through that, just really, it reminded me of the time I would say in 2017, 2018, early 2018, when everyone was talking about Now's the time to build. Now's the time to build. The infrastructure has to get better. And now when you take a step back and look at where we are today, it's pretty crazy how much more accessible this, this environment is, how easy it is for anyone to just go and get exposure to Bitcoin through the uh, services that they likely already have access to, PayPal, Robinhood, whatever it may be. And I, I think that on top of that, you're seeing macro trends, just like in the past, you could see that Apple... Amazon, Google, these companies were going to dominate because over 7 billion people around the world were going to have access to a smartphone. And right now we're seeing these macro types of trends and the status quo being disrupted to a certain degree and the incumbents really not wanting that to happen. So I think it's great that you really are explaining people have to look one layer deeper, two layers deeper than the announcements that they might be reading out on the news. What would you say are the trends that you're most excited about? And how do you think that this is all going to play out over the next five, 10 years? It's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day news, day-to-day -day minutia, but I mean, where do you think that this is all heading towards? And First of all, and my experience in what they call the 40 Act for investment advisors, and there's the 34 Act, which is for publicly listed companies and 33 Act for private companies uh, in that process. So there's lots of securities laws and layers and divisions with it. And it always takes importance as, as the leader at the top. When Trump came into power, really important was the leadership he had at the SEC, Clayton. Clayton understood capital market formation. He also understood that there were a lot of bad dudes in the ICO market, basically faking that they're really securities trying to say they're a digital coin and they were just stealing money. And I tip my hat to him. And now who's head of the SEC, same thing. You know that the SEC went after these bad guys and they cleaned up Dodge. Really important. So new, as I said earlier, the new CEOs of these crypto mining companies, 
another level, institutional quality. The new stable coins coming out, et cetera. Everything's more that's going to protect the investors. So I, I feel very bullish about that. But he was also very focused on capital market formation. One of the big parts of the U.S. is a leader on, it's not just a new digital something. It is the ability for you and I to communicate and you to, to speculate and invest or save, take your savings and put it into a new idea. There's no one more advanced in the U.S. in both breadth and depth in this. It's very creative, the formation of capital. And so he had noticed that the number of IPOs, and I had written about this on my blog every week, many times over the past 20 years, that each year you saw a shrinkage of the number of mutual funds. You saw a shrinkage of the number of public companies. You saw private equity taking over private companies. And that mechanism for people learning how to go public, the average IPO before to the year 2000 was $80 million. Now it's half a billion. The costs are up eightfold. It was just prohibitive. So private equity would come in and you as a retail investor couldn't participate with private equity. So it was the rich were getting richer. It was sort of the unexpected consequences of regulations was actually hurting the retail investor. So he made it seamless. He did everything to streamline the regulatory process, uh, the concepts that came out under Obama, under crowdfunding, these mechanisms called at the market transactions, AMT. All of these things really got pushed through under his leadership that allowed for riot to pay all their SEC legal bills. They use an AMT mechanism. And then they use this AMT mechanism to raise a billion dollars to build up their infrastructure. And the same thing with Marathon. But this all was really pushed along under the leadership of Clayton. Uh, so I think he did a phenomenal job. And that's just very important for the next level. Now the head of the SEC taught blockchain and understands this industry at MIT. Uh, and so he is not going to be, you know, anti, he's going to be anti these, these banditos that say they're an ICO and they're not, but the, the whole concept of blockchain and crypto mining, it's going to grow because it's very significant from an accounting point of view. The, the concept of transparency, I had mentioned earlier that had all the weapons of mass destruction, as Warren Buffett liked to call them, these credit default swaps. Had they been actually on the blockchain, the Federal Reserve would have seen it wasn't a, a half a trillion dollar risk. It was only seven billion. They could have written a check. The whole thing would have not had a crisis to the degree had it been on the blockchain. And so this mechanism of, of triple entry is profound because the Venetians and the Medici bankers really created a middle class. The trading mechanism, double entry accounting allowed for trade and allowed for the middle class to grow because prior to that, it was noble and kings and the haves and have nots. And, and this, we get to this negative narrative today with banking, but really banks facilitate the growth of the middle class. When you take a look at when the 1400s, when it became sort of standardized double entry, we had a boom, the renaissance of global economy. Now we're at the digital world and we have blockchain. And this is this me the mechanism of a sort of a triple entry. This is only going to grow. And, and I think it's just exciting to be a participant in that. Bitcoin validated that you can do that. And smart contracts, I believe, uh, with Ethereum are going to be the backbone of the apps for blockchain. So with that, I'm so thrilled that Hive is the only public company mining both Ethereum and Bitcoin and holding, which I call green and clean. And I remember on a panel it, uh, in Miami getting attacked, you know, this, this sort of Frank coin. And then everyone started laughing and chanting Frank coin, Frank coin, because I'm of the opinion that if you hodl a clean coin, Bitcoin, it's never been in a dark pool, never been in anywhere in the world. It's going to be like Andy Warhol art in 10 years from now. We're going to go through two more halvings. We're going to be much closer to no coins being mined. Uh, and someone's going to make this piece of art showing the 64 digits. And they're going to have a picture of a Bitcoin, but they're going to have embedded in there. It's going to be valuable art. I think digital is much bigger uh, the ecosystem globally is much bigger. So it could go to a million dollars and it's okay because fractals will be there.
with the PayPals and the Robinhood. Something else for your listeners to realize, I didn't know it, is that when we were getting listed for the with Hive, uh, the prospectus was filed for Robinhood. And, and it was supposedly uh, the narrative on Bloomberg was that it was delayed of getting through the SEC because 14% of their profits came from crypto. And what's really important, which I found from my Jets ETF, was that the early investors into Jets were Robin Hood, 25,000 and bought it around 12, $13 range, and it went to 28. Buffett dumped them all, got out of them. He hates Bitcoin, he hated the airlines. And, and he left a lot of money on the table. That new Robinhood trader investor is much more sophisticated using Google to do their research to make their decision. Um, and, and so you're seeing this whole mechanism. And then naturally, the big houses are going to attack Robinhood, attack Robinhood, et cetera. But I think they've done an incredible job of enticing people into what makes America great. It's free markets. It's free capitalism. But what I found from my jets was called price discovery. Very important word. If you don't have price discovery, how do you know the value? And what we saw was that the volume of jets went from 40,000 to 400,000. And this brought in institutional players. First of all, the millennials trading at Robinhood, all these minnows coming in, price discovery, it's a good deal, it's a good deal. Then came the barracudas. Then came the sharks, then came the groupers, then came the sailfish. Oh, now come the whales. Uh, now it's trading 8 million shares a day. That same mechanism happened to Hive. Hive started, his volume started surging and surging. And last year, we traded more than the other crypto stocks. We traded 2.2 billion shares in Germany, Canada, and over the counter in the U.S., Thank God, but now we're on, for me, we're on NASDAQ. And this is a big game changer because we're the only real ESG strategy company. We're the only one mining both Ethereum and Bitcoin. And because we mine Ethereum, we're the most profitable still. Yeah. Make, so in this future growth, I'm going to share with you, it's hard to get your machines, even with the drama in China. It's improved logistics wise, but it's still a drama. And all these forecasts for all these big main machines coming in, and yes, they're very profitable machines, there's nothing but delays and disappointments. And so the Ethereum mechanism for us has been great. So as I'll share with you sort of the inside, insightful information, when we go and buy a Bitmain, you have to put 50% of the money up front. And then you're at the whim of when that machine is actually going to come. Uh, we had a negative experience with Canon, did a great price deal. And then all of a sudden they start calling, well, we can't give you the total terahash that you want. We're going to be two terahash. You're not going to get 90. You're going to get 88. Well, why? We paid for 90. Uh, you want to cancel the contract? Why? Because we paid 30 bucks a terahash and they're now trading at 90 and they want to turn around and try to sell it to someone else. There is no customer loyalty by these companies. Very important. Uh, that's why I love seeing that shift. Now, one of the big parts of the, the story for Hive is the strategic relationship we just announced with NVIDIA. You know, this is very, now we're going to be a very significant player. We're going to get into high-performance computing. When you're in a high-performance computing, you don't measure the, the value such as $2 a day from an old AMD card mining Ethereum. That's what you make, $2 a day. You make $2 an hour. And you're 50% cheaper for providing that service than Amazon. Or if you're a rendering, you're making movies, you're doing animation, you're a gamer, uh, you want to do uh, artificial intelligence research for cancer, uh, use the system. Uh, that mechanism is, I believe, it going to grow and some of these smaller data centers. And so I think that this allows us to say we mine Ethereum, we get our money and capital back and allows us to grow because I think you're going to see these small centers like Starbucks are all over America, Starbucks all over the world. You're going to see these small data centers, one to five megawatts of energy offer this high performance computing because people want to be close to where that information is within 200 miles. So I see that as another way for the longevity and for the growth for Hive. So it's really exciting. Uh, we're just early in exploring that mechanism, just like in, in Sweden, uh, we're putting greenhouse, the concept of putting a greenhouse in the back and those 12,000 hair dryers, basically blowing all that heat out 
And you got to think of that's what each of these GPUs or these rigs are pushing out this air. We can recapture it and you wouldn't have a carbon footprint from getting food such as cabbage and tomatoes from Italy and from Spain up to northern uh, uh, Sweden to be right in our home backyard. So there's many of these exciting parts in that ESG strategy. And we believe the, that these new NVIDIA chips, well, we don't give the money half up front. We basically, we, we have a contract, we have a commitment. We're not out there just, just crypto miners. We have another longer term vision to build out these facilities uh, throughout Europe and North America. So, so you I'm guys aren't example. just a Bitcoin mining company. You're doing all these other things, Ethereum You're mining, high chain. performance. You're a blockchain, blockchain, blockchain mining. Blockchain mining. Yeah. And, and we're going to go into high performance computing. It's very profitable. It's much more stable cash flow. Uh, and we've been investments in DeFi. Uh, we're looking at a very exciting deal on NFTs. Uh, so we are really that blockchain company that functions like in the gold business, they call a gold royalty company. We do over $10 million of revenue per employee. Uh, so I'm very excited about the, the, being unique in that space. Yeah. What are your thoughts on um, on the future of Ethereum and mining on that end? Because a lot of miners, they have, um, I, I think that they're almost like the equivalent of they explore it only to a certain depth of, uh, oh, well, the protocol might change and it might remove mining. And so then they might just decide, oh, well, I'm just going to go with Bitcoin because I know the protocol is not going to change. But right. in terms of getting to those deeper levels, what what are your full thoughts and, and really approach towards going and saying, hey, I'm going to look at Ethereum mining and allocate a portion of my hash power and investment into Ethereum, not just Bitcoin? Great question, because when the launching of Hive, the first coin we mined was Ethereum. We bought the facility in Iceland and uh, using geothermal energy. And all we heard was, that's crazy. Why would you do that? You know, because it's immediate revenue and cash flow with an 80% gross margin. That's why we did that, is always my response. And <laughs> yeah, which is uh, a good answer. <laughs> and, and, and you're on a, on a big secular trade here. This is a big wave trade. And so, no proof of stake is going to wipe it out. It's going to happen. 2017, it hasn't happened yet. So our thesis has been this, when the proof of stake, the first real movement took place to have some teeth to it was in December. And all our, our thoughts were, all they're going to do is take supply out. That's all they did. They basically, 5% of the Ethereum market disappeared of supply. So as the price was going up, all these people are locked up in earning an income. We made much more money in capital appreciation than that income. Or shareholders. Holding Ethereum was a much bigger win than putting this, putting our coins up for, for getting an income. We think that we just see now that it was supposed to come in in August, uh, London. For we had Berlin, and then we have London, and now London's not going to be dealing with, with proof of uh of work. It's not, that's going to be pushed down again because it's very difficult. They cannot all agree. Um, they, they have to be really careful they don't get hacked, like the, the whole story, the drama of Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. Uh, so it's not so easy to say, oh, we're just going to go do this and, and stop uh, crypto mining. It's just not going to happen. I think you've got another two to three years. And every time they come up with these new creations, et cetera, they're shrinking the supply, just like Bitcoin having did. Wow. And, and if you have gold supply, I tell people if that supply of gold of 100 million ounces a year was to go to 50 million, gold's 4,000, gold's 10,000. That's what would happen because the demand for gold is really underbidding its GDP per capita growth in population. Who's the fastest growing economies in GDP per capita? China and India. So guess what? You go back 20, 30 years ago, China and India were... 10% of global demand for gold. And China was only 2%, but they're 40% of the world's population. Fast forward, they're now number one and number three in GDP per capita growth. There's China, America, and India. And they're now 55% of all gold demand. So gold is love. Really, they underpinning. Every time gold sells off big, the love trade comes in. 
And it's the underpinning that they don't trust their paper money. They don't trust it. They wear their gold. They give it as gift giving. Uh, this is the year of the bull. If you were born in this 12 year cycle, every 12 years as the bull comes along and you're uh, will born in the year of that cycle of a bull and, and your dad has done well this year, he's going to give you a three gram gold bull. Now, your dad's hit a home run because he got Bitcoin early. He's going to give you a five ounce uh, gold, uh, big, uh, sorry, gold bull. Uh, and, and that is, is something that's just not going away. It's cultural. And, and so I think what's happening, uh, if you limit that supply, it would trade higher. And I think you're going to see the same thing uh, with Ethereum as more of the argument and proof of stake and more change they make. It's just going to shrink the supply. Uh, that's going to drive the prices higher, along with what we saw in 2017 was the explosion in ICOs. Well, they used the backbone of Ethereum algorithm. So the faster the ICO market grew, the more Ethereum exploded. Then the ICO market went under attack, Ethereum fell more. So now the ICO market has been modestly growing, but um, NFTs, explosion in growth, explosion. Stable coins like JP Morgan launching, huge growth. They're all using the Ethereum algorithm. So in fact, Ethereum has outperformed Bitcoin over the past 12 months for that reason. The DeFi, huge, huge. We make big fees every day on, on staking. Uh, and those are not staking, but those are uh, using the gas fees. And this is the big fight between the stakers and the gas fees. Well, as, as more products come in and they're going to use more Ethereum, then we get these gas fees. So we are very comfortable. If they go away, we believe that Ethereum is only going to trade higher. And so we think we're in a sweet spot and let them all be naysayers. You know why it's goodwill? Because only, only one other mining company has announced they're going to mine Ethereum. And that's been HUD-8. And they're getting very specific machines from uh, Ethereum, from uh, NVIDIA, but they only mine Ethereum. Uh, they're very profitable machines, but they're going to sell Ethereum to buy Bitcoin. That's their model. And, but those machines are not able to go and use for gaming. And gaming is a big industry. They're not able to go use those chips to go and do rendering or artificial intelligence in the cloud. We, in our position, will be able to, as we build out these uh, sort of modular, uh, high-performance computing data centers. Yeah. And one of the things that I've talked with a handful of people about, like the HPC, high-performance computing, and it seems like there's a whole nother barrier to get into that type of a business, right? So um, it's not necessarily the exact same design of the facility, based on what I know. And it's also not the exact same um it's just not as easy as just going and mining Bitcoin. There seems to be other steps to it. How, how is it that you guys went in and, and figured this whole puzzle out? And, and, and how are you approaching, honestly, getting this part of the business up and running? You know, when I first heard this whole argument on proof of work, proof of stake, and I was very fortunate to meet a young man, uh, Gabe Layden. Gabe Layden was the founder and visionary behind Machine Zone. Machine Zone, um, as he told me the story, I wrote about this. I'll send a, a copy of my uh, interview. He's processing 500 million instructions per second in 32 languages. So if you're a young kid from Hungary and another kid in Taiwan, well, what's the hip cool word? Like what's the word cool mean? This, in, and it would immediately translate. So you would talk to each other, but you would see it in your native tongue. And so therefore, he could have all the, these kids around the world playing this app. They felt there was no issue on language. And that's why it grew to six billion in revenue. So this, and he was explaining to me that our facility in Iceland alone could process a hundred million instructions per second with old AMD chips, with only four megawatt, uh, four, sorry, four mega cards, gigabyte cards. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And he has been doing this in New Zealand and he created the first sort of smart city there and explained to them. So they put up cameras everywhere. They got an app and tell you exactly when the bus is going to come. The cameras can identify people that are that have not paid or stolen cars. They can identify with AI the uh, bad criminals if there's someone's wanted. Uh, and women feel much more safer, safer with this software. 
Metropolis.io is one of the best artificial intelligence software for smart cities. So this business is going to grow. So this, this idea of these high-performance computer data centers and say San Antonio wants to deal with crime and drug problems, et cetera, the best way to do it is to put these cameras up, load up all these bad characters in the faces, all the stolen cars immediately get shown up, the license is immediately shown, they drive through that area, ping, goes to the police. This is where they're located with GPS. I mean, that's where the dangers of Big Brother is, but on the other hand, it's where people are safer. And who drives a lot of that in their particular women because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they have to feel safe emotionally, physically, financially. And physically is important. And this type of weeding out the bad characters in a society that it makes them feel better. Well, Frank, this conversation has been so unbelievably amazing and incredible. It's so fun hearing you talk through all these concepts. Are there any places that everyone listening can go connect with you online or the company that you want to direct them to? Go to highblockchaintechnology.com. Uh, uh, we have a very robust uh, YouTube station, uh, educating short videos, two minutes, three minutes. So anyone has a attention deficit problem like I do, you know, it's, it's quick. Uh, uh, give me an insight in, in two to three minutes. And I write about the world of, and I talk about crypto every week, but I write about everything about the world, my global travels and global funds at usfunds.com. So you subscribe to Frank Talk uh, and you'll get, to, if you're not interested in gold, you can click through and read about uh, what we just talked about, uh, the misinformation on, on green energy in the crypto space. And this is the real information. Love it. Well, for the last question, I'll give you an option of which one you want to answer. Uh, it's a, either a price prediction uh, by the end of year for either Ethereum or Bitcoin, or if you want, you can just give a prediction about the general um, state of the mining industry, because uh, some people might not want to put out a price prediction. So I'll, I'll leave it to you, let you answer any of those three. When Ethereum went from a couple of hundred bucks to $300 to uh, a couple thousand. Uh, it's a ma monster move. And, yeah. uh, but Hive went up 2,000%. So what you see in the gold business, that when gold is in a, in a bull market, the gold stocks outperform. Vice versa, when you're in a bear cycle, short cycle, it doesn't matter, the gold stocks underperform. So that's what we're witnessing right now uh, in, in this space. And the only way to counter that is to have faster growth in your revenue per share and your cash flow per share. And institutions use that from a quant model. We're very early innings on, on looking at the different mining companies of what their value metrics are. Um, we know that to right now, so far, we're still the most profitable because we're mining both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, and if all the other machines come in for the peers, then they'd have a much bigger footprint. But on a per share basis, I think we're we're very, very competitive. Um, so what I think for investors is the DNA of volatility. Please, please, please respect. Everyone has a different look and a different DNA. Every asset class has its own DNA of volatility. So the stock market can go up or down 2% in a day, and that's his DNA 7% of the time. 2%. Gold is 1%. Gold stocks are 3%. So gold stocks are more volatile, but most of the talking heads on CNBC say, oh, gold's very volatile. It's actually less volatile than the S&P 500. Bitcoin and Ethereum are 6%. So I'm a big believer that having gold in your portfolio at 10% and having Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Hive as your proxy, having 2% is just wise and rebalancing that. I just think it's a good alternative asset class. But we're looking at this DNA of volatility, Tesla has the same DNA of volatility as the miners. Over any, any day, it's plus or minus 6%. So buy in the dips when you get it down 10%, 12% in a day, uh, and that's going to happen X number of times over the year. That's when you want to be putting on your buy trade. And any time it jumps 25% uh, in a day, you got to take some profits if you're a trader. And recognize and respect the DNA volatility because life is all about managing expectations. That's a great answer. I love it. Thanks again for coming on, Frank. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Will. And happy investing.